Water is life. Water is life. Thousands have lived without love, not one without water. The right to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation is a human right that is essential for the full enjoyment of life and all human rights. Whiskey is for drinking. Water is for fighting over. When the well is dry, we learn the worth of water. Water is life. Water is life. Water is life. Good morning. Thank you all for showing up so bright and early. Um, I want to thank uh, Reverend Sheila Bates for inviting me to give this talk to you today, and, all to, um, and also to everyone at Next UMC and GBHEM. So we all know the importance of water, and the slides that you just saw really reminded us how critically important water is to all our lives. But let me start by asking, how many of you drank water in the last 24 hours? Let's see a show of hands. So almost everyone, right? But why do, why do we drink water? Well, we drink water because it's necessary. It's necessary for our survival. We drink water because it is a biologically necessary and non-substitutable resource. We cannot drink oil. We need, it, we need water as something that to survive, but we also need it for life flourishing on Earth. So while 70% of the Earth is covered by water, only 2.5% of it is fresh water. And of that 2.5%, only a small amount is fresh water. So you may be wondering, why am I telling you these facts? It's just to stress how critically limited fresh water is on Earth. But clean, safe water is really important for people's ability to live full and healthy lives and engage in social progress. However, water shortages are increasingly common around the world because there is both an uneven distribution but also an uneven system of access. And as a result, we're seeing competing demands for water, whether it's for agriculture, industrial production, or domestic use. And through millennia, water has always been keenly contested over. We've dammed water, piped water, contaminated water, polluted water. But I want to talk to you today about how won uh, wonderful water is and how water is a many-splendored thing. The remarkable thing about water is that it seeps across all boundaries. It is simultaneously economic, political, social, cultural, institutional, spiritual, and ecological. It is never just one of these things. Water plays such a critical role in all of our lives that we don't even often pay attention to it. Water is necessary for urban planning, for industrial production, for food production, for international development, for ec to economic policies, but also for political strife. Geopolitics is often influenced by water, geopolitical stability, ecological sustainability, people's sense of self, their cultural practices, but also people's religious and spiritual practices. For me, water is a lens through which I try to understand complex social and environmental issues. And I'm really passionate about water, and I hope to make you passionate about water too. And you may be wondering why. Well, because there's a real global crisis on water that's going on and water is becoming increasingly scarce. This global water crisis that's happening is something we don't often think about in the US. But there is great inequalities in who has access to safe, clean drinking water. And these inequities are not just on the physical quantity that's available, but about quality, about availability, about affordability, about access, use, management, and control. And there's also very different values and uses of water. While some may experience a crisis, others do not. So consider these contrasting realities. That there's plentiful and easy access to water for many people around the world, 
water is taken for granted in some places. While 800 million people globally do not have access to reliable, safe, clean drinking water on a daily basis. 750,000 annual preventable water-related deaths take place, largely from contaminated water, but also waterborne diseases. And then 2,000 deaths per day of children under the age of five. That's quite unconscionable in this day and age, no? So let's do a thought experiment for a second. Imagine for a second that all the water sources you rely upon suddenly disappeared. No water in the taps, in the pipes, the wells have gone dry, and there's no bottled water. Take a minute to think about how would you feel, what would you do? Where would you get your drinking water, your cooking water, water for sanitation, hygiene, showering, doing laundry, or any other daily needs? Would you feel panic? Would you feel anger? Would you feel frustration? Who would you turn to? Who would you hold responsible to resolve these issues? What if you couldn't get enough water for your family? Would you feel helpless or hopeless? Now imagine that is exactly how millions of people feel on a daily basis around the world, because their water is not guaranteed. I've lived and worked on three continents, and I've witnessed how much water can affect entire communities and households and the panic I felt when the taps went dry because there was a power outage and the water pumps wouldn't work, and the visceral guilt I felt when I would see small children and their mothers trek for miles to find safe, clean water. And what, we're, what I'm trying to say is that these kinds of exposure to experience or knowledge or understanding can make us become water scholars to fix these global issues because these kinds of statistics shouldn't exist in this day and age. What is the problem? This is what we need to get to, not just they don't have water. We need to also understand that there's a great difference in the history, spatiality, and social difference in who has access to and control over what kind of water. If your water is contaminated, it doesn't really matter if there's a huge body of water near you because it's no longer usable. What we're seeing now is that globally across spaces, there's increasing water struggling taking place. And this cumulatively is leading to what we call the greater global water crisis. One of the ways that water is going to become more critical over time is through climate change, because climate change is essentially hydrological change. Differences in rainfall patterns and precipitation, shifts in the weather, whether it's rain or snow or drought, and these kinds of effects in availability of water affect ecological change. So the plants and animals around us are changing their behaviors, it's affecting us as well. Even in places where we have plentiful water, um, such as most of the United States, where we take water for granted, we should start to worry, because climate change will make the waters disappear and shift in their availability and their reliability. So as a result, ensuring access to safe water is something that we should be worried about because water affects educational opportunities for employment, for health. But here's the interesting thing, it reduces gender disparity because women are often the managers of water in the home. Water is very much a gender issue because women and girls around the world are burdened with having to fetch water even where places where white piped water may exist because it may not be reliable. Hundreds of hours a week are spent in fetching precious water. What's really strange is that we don't often think of water as a gendered issue. For a second, think about who bathed you when you were an infant. Who did your laundry when you're two months old? It's usually moms, right? Moms undertake this care work, this domestic labor around the world and it's a kind of work that requires water, a reliable, safe, a safe, clean water. And as a result, water comes to affect not just individuals, but people's sense of their roles in the home and how they interact with other members of their household. It is thus an urgent and imperative that we pay more attention to the different ways that water affects us here and around the world and start to notice these connections and commonalities that exist and not assume that water crisis is something that's happening over there. 
I want to now talk to you about global water crises that are happening slightly differently in different places. So in the global south, or in the developing world, or in poorer nations, there are various different kinds of water crises. These are the ones that we often see in the news, or in, in different kinds of readings we may come across, or different magazines. So fetching water from far away is something I've just mentioned, right? So women and daughters and daughters-in-laws and moms and grandmas are usually fetching water through floods and through droughts. This is an ar arduous task. Young girls often drop out of school to help in this care work for the household. So this has an intergenerational impact because what we're seeing is this lack of education is affecting over the life course in the girls becoming future mothers or whether they have um, employment opportunities or not. But we're also seeing, seeing that in the larger cities, as more and more people flock to cities in the search of livelihood, that there's no water in the cities. If you do not have legal access to land, you cannot claim your right to municipal water. And what we're seeing increasingly is that the very poor of the global south are paying exorbitant rates for water because they do not have subsidized tap water. And this water is often a huge percentage of their household budget. And this issue of precarity, of precarious lives, of public health, is something that we should be concerned about. Water is very much a health issue and very much a development issue for most governments around the world. Addressing poverty and social change is something almost all governments and nation states think about. However, the social difference in who matters, who gets clean water, is very political. Who has access to sufficient amounts of safe water is something that's debated and worked out through various laws and legal instruments. One way to enhance the number of people who have access to water is to increase technology and infrastructure, build more dams and pipes and so on. But guess what? These have po positive and negative impacts. And we therefore need to look at both the pros and cons, the benefits and the sufferings that can happen across space and across scales. For instance, you may build a dam to divert river water to another area, but people who historically depended on that traditional water source will suddenly be deprived. And there's also this whole controversy about water being diverted to cities and not to rural areas. And there's another controversy of water for humans versus non-human living other beings. So water becomes an issue that environmental scholars are worried about, government are worried about, policymakers are worried about. Now let me give you some examples of the global water crisis in the global north, which is the more advanced industrialized countries, the more wealthy countries. We are seeing water crises develop here too. And I'll share some examples from the US that you may be familiar with. First one is Flint, Michigan, where water quality has been a crisis for quite some time. Lead contamination has led to poisoning of children and it's largely because of aging infrastructure and bad policies. So what we're seeing is that Flint may be the most dramatic case of poisoned water in the US, and especially among communities of color, but lead is highly problematic in many cities around the US. A second example is the historic drought in California, where there's been a lack of water for irrigation of crops, and as well, what we're seeing is that there's increasing siphoning of precious groundwater by bottled water companies. And this has led to a huge controversy of, well, who gets access to this limited amount of water? And it also raises the issue of how do we learn to value water? Do we value water when it's taken out of a watershed and sold in bottles to somewhere else? Or it's used in that watershed for domestic purposes or agricultural purposes? A third one is something that's been in the news for a couple of weeks, but largely for a few months. It's the issue at Standing Rock, which is an example of an ongoing crisis of governance, where protecting water source against large corporation and the Dakota Access Pipeline has gained international attention. The water is life movement, the water is life movement emerged as water protectors are fighting to prevent pollution of a sacred and necessary water source on native land. But it's really much more about water. It's about sovereignty, Native American land rights, and state-led violence against protesters and water protectors. So all of these examples, both from the
the global north and the global south, shows the many different ways that water is connected to broader issues of democracy, citizenship, and development. We're thus seeing crises and injustices and sufferings of very different kinds, right? Different communities on different issues, both here and abroad. But this, this status quo is really not acceptable. Why do we accept it? We shouldn't. We need to change the system. So you may be wondering, well, how can we change the system? We have great examples to follow. The global water justice movements, or often called water justice warriors, have been critical in trying to change the status quo and share information on various water crises and injustices. They have been raising awareness on the broader issues linked to water, and here are some examples from various water justice movements in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and North America. And the important thing is that they are basically fighting and protesting various kinds of water-related issues, but collectively, they remind us, again, of the many splendored thing that is water. That water is ecological, it's social, it's political, it's economic, it's a legal issue. And they've been raising this awareness and calling on people to both understand how we relate to water, but also what needs to change. And what we've learned is that there's no easy or simple or singular action to address a global water crisis. Because water crisis is not just a technological issue. It's a political one and a social one. And context matters. Where you are and what water crises are happening is related to what water justice action you want to take. Because at the end of the day, water is essentially about power. The power to decide, to control, to allocate, to manage thereby control people's very lives. So in response to the global water justice movement, here's what's been done at the international level. In 2010, the United Nations passed the resolution on the human right to water, which states, the right to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation is a human right that is essential for the full enjoyment of life and all human rights. Think about that for a moment. It's very basic and intuitive, right? If you can't have water, you cannot reproduce your body, you cannot survive, then all other rights disappear if you're no longer alive. So what the Right to Water Resolution did was basically announce that this is a universal right, it has to be ensured by governments, and the guidelines are meant for the progressive realization of the right to water. And what this means is paying attention to quality, to safety of water, to reliability, to affordability, accessibility, availability, and acceptability. All these aspects are important, not just one over the other. And this international resolution, which was passed, uh, approved by both the United Nations General Assembly and the United Nations Human Rights Council, basically asks us to look at the motive of what's going on with water management. It needs to be figured out in, in each context, in each country. We need to work together in figuring out how safe water can be made available so we can move away from the current crises and sufferings. So to do that, we need to have much broader conversations about equity, about sustainability, about rights, about fairness, about local accountability, about the democratic process, and addressing different needs. Now, water justice warriors were absolutely instrumental in bringing this international policy to fruition. They advocated and mobilized around the world. They galvanized people to demand democratizing water governance for recognizing various struggles and addressing issues of social injustice and, and inequity. Now, the cumulative effects of these F efforts by activists, scholars, practitioners, community members, and students we're very successful in bringing about this transformation in policy. While this policy was not ratified by all countries, because 41 abstained, including the US, 122 countries supported the resolution. And yet what we're seeing is even without national policy support, the discourses around the right to water can open up and foster conversations around democracy, citizenship, and development, and social justice, as we're witnessing in the US in Flint and Standing Rock. So the various water crises that currently exist that will get worse with 
um, upcoming and existing climate change, is also going to worse, get worse with further commodification of water. Now, water justice warriors and movements have been fighting this battle because they really think that water should be kept in the public good. It should be held in the commons. It should not be something that you can have only if you can afford it. And this is one of the key things that has really emerged from global movements around water, that for people to have access to water, we need to not allow water to become a commodity that has a market value. Because if you're too poor, you're pushed out of the market. You cannot afford this biologically necessary and non-substitutable resource that we all rely upon on this little blue planet we call home. So you may be wondering, well, why should I care about all this? Well, first, it's the right thing to do, but also because water crisis may affect you and your family sooner than you think. Because water is a finite resource, because it is biologically necessary and it is non-substitutable. And therefore, we need to do something about it. We have sources of inspiration. So even though I've told you a whole lot of negative realities and sufferings that exist, I don't want you to feel disheartened. There's plenty you can do. So now let me turn to how you can change the world, because I want you to change the world. You are the next generation. You have the power to do greater good. So despite all the sufferings and injustices and the politics and the violence that we're seeing in people being separated from their water source, their water source being diverted, contaminated, appropriated, people being dispossessed from their water source, we can actually make a difference. First thing is water education. We need to learn about water issues and commit to it. We need greater robust education on water so that you can understand all the multiple and complex connections that can be made and learn how to make them clear and empower people with knowledge so everyone can make informed decisions and take action. So you must therefore educate yourself first, empower yourself first, and then educate others around you. There are many great tools out there. If you want to learn how to measure your water footprint, the foot, water footprint of your household, of your family, of how what you eat, what you buy, already connects you to other people in other places and their water sources. So maybe you can start to think about more conscious consumption. But then we also need to ask the right questions. We need to ask, what kind of questions do we need to answer in this specific context? How do we undertake complex analysis? And how do we foster commitment to resolve issues that may take a long time to resolve? These are not easy, quick fixes. So therefore, with greater water education, you can foster that kind of understanding of local global connections, examining the complexities that are often overlooked, and explain why things are the way they are and what can be changed to improve the situation. Join water scholars and practitioners and planners and activists to collect and share critical information and knowledge and thus become a water educator. A second thing that I would advise is develop a water ethic, which means rethink your relationship to water. Investigate the ways that your lifestyles and choices impact water resources around the world. Recognize that your relationship to water is a product of various historical struggles, of processes and politics, and these reflect much deeper social, economic, legal issues and ecological issues. Where does your water come from? Learn about your watershed, your water source, and that of all the watersheds and water sources where everything you consume, whether it's food, items of clothing, furniture, everything needs water to be made. You are already connected. So once you develop a water ethic, you can start to change habits for yourself and your family, but also get involved in how water plays such a central role in various struggles. We may think there's a war going on somewhere, but if you really investigate it, it could have been there was a crop failure. It could have been about a historical issue about water rights. So once we start to trace things back, we can really start to see those kinds of connections. A third way to start to change the world is to get involved in 
water justice, to advocate for water justice, and get involved. So we need to think critically and commit to making a change in our lives and advocate for others who do not have voice and power. You can get involved in local or re regional water justice efforts right here in your state or maybe in your region. But also recognize that water justice is never just local. Yeah, it's cross-scalar and global. And pay attention to the ways that water is an issue about gender, class, race, ethnicity, identity, and place, and how all of these issues are linked to broader issues of social justice. You can work with others and inspire others to promote equity, human rights, and social justice, and thereby become a water warrior yourself. Fourthly, we need to democratize how water is managed and governed so that various voices can be heard and included. And people need to participate in water management issues because governing water should not just be, be left up to politicians or technocrats. Water is us too. We are water. And we need to ensure that the poor, the marginalized, and then the silenced are given a voice and are heeded in the planning process and how water is managed. And don't let corporations take control of our precious water resources, but keep water as a common good or a public good and fight for the right to water. Ultimately, recognize that water is a moral issue. It is not just about access and distribution and protection and conservation and consumption, because water is very much an issue of how we see the world and how we treat others, whether it's humans or non-living human others. Because those who have the power to control water can decide who lives, whose livelihoods matter, and who does not. And you need, we need to learn to stress to decision makers and people in power that water is a moral and ethical concern. It is not just an economic one. Water issues are thus never just only about water, but about much, much more. Water is everything. I want us to start thinking about how water is everything. Everything we do is water. We come from water. We need water to survive. So in, in, in conclusion, what I want to do is inspire you to do good by having purpose to learn more about water, to think differently, to think across scales and spaces, to be open to critical thinking and research, to build your arsenal of knowledge, to make informed decisions and actions and advocate for others. Challenge yourself to learn more, get involved, create opportunities for friends and family to learn and be involved, Think what changes you can make individually right now. Maybe you can learn to conserve water, enhance water stewardship where you live, buy and consume more ethically and consciously and carefully. Think long-term about climate change. Get involved in water justice movements. But after you've done that for you, yourself, and your family, also get your school to get involved, your town and your state and figure out what everyone can do at these different scales and how you can bring about change. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change you want to see in the world. The future is what we create, and we can have a more just world if we want it. We can have a world with greater water justice for people and the planet. I invite you to commit to making a difference today, not tomorrow, but today. Thank you.